good afternoon and welcome or good morning depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to this webinar provided by NPL and the Smart Group. My name is Bob Willis and I'll be presenting today's webinar. Now today's webinar is a coordination of activity based on an, the conformal coating and cleaning experience that we're running in the UK. This particular webinar will deal with cleaning, it will deal with conformal coating and also deal with process defects associated with those processes. Before we start uh, the webinar this afternoon, what I'd first like to do is introduce you to the control panel, which allows you to do a number of things during the presentation. First of all, you can open and close the control panel on, on your screen by clicking on the orange button. This prevents the control panel obscuring your view of some of the slides during your presentation. You can click on the blue button which makes the image on your screen or on your projection facility in your conference room go full screen, giving you the best view of the slides and videos uh, during this presentation. Now if you want to ask questions, all you need to do is type your question directly in to the control panel as indicated here by the red arrow. Now you can do this at any time during the webinar, but I'll try and pick up on some questions at the end of the webinar. If we don't have the opportunity of answering all the questions, of course we'll have the opportunity of discussing your process issues and problems at the conformal coating and cleaning experience, uh, which is happening on the 8th and 10th, 8th to the 10th of April. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your in registration and reminder emails. You'll also need your webinar ID number and access code. It's not possible for myself, the presenter, to assist you during a live presentation. At the end of the presentation, we have a couple of survey questions on the content of the webinar and also feedback on what you'd like to hear in the future. We'll be sending a copy of the slides uh, or making those available to you shortly after uh, the webinar. So once again, thank you very much uh, to Smart Group, NPL and all our supporters on the conformal coating cleaning experience. Now, I've mentioned the cleaning experience a couple of times. Um, there's information you can get on our activity, which is a free seminar and also practical workshop that we're running at NEW, the exhibition in the UK, during the 8th to the 10th of April. And you can get more information on that by clicking on the link when you receive the slides. Basically, what we're doing is we have an area, approximately 6 by 11 meters, uh, within the show. And what we're going to be doing is running seminars and practical demonstrations of cleaning, contamination testing, conformal coating, rework and inspection. So it's a dedicated area on these particular subjects. The printed circuit board we'll be using uh, is illustrated here, which includes a range of different surface mount components. We'll also be doing our other testing on this particular printed circuit board. As well as that, uh, IPC are supporting this activity by providing wall charts which illustrate the cleaning and conformal coating and contamination testing uh, specifications which are available. And this is a, a color wall chart. We've also got a range of IPC standards that are being offered as best prize during the sessions. One other thing that we've put together which uh, again you can uh, download if you'd like uh, now by accessing the web address here is a guide to conformal coating and cleaning defects. This is a picture guide that I put together illustrating some of the most common defects, some of which we'll be talking about during this webinar. But if you'd like this free color booklet, all you need to do is download it from the website listed. Now the seminars we're running uh, which again free of charge and technical papers will be available at the conference are listed here. You can review this at your leisure but we've tried to in, in, uh, encompass 
all of the most common issues related to cleaning and contamination and also conformal coating. So let's start to talk about the cleaning process and conformal coating and defects. First of all, for your reference, here is a listing of or illustration of some of the most common booklets that are available in the industry. Uh, the newest of the cleaning coating handbooks which is available uh, is listed below. Now I've put together a complete list with all of the ISBN numbers and also further information on all of the cleaning and conformal coating titles and specifications and IPC documents. That's included at the end of this webinar and you'll be able to review those at your leisure. There are of course lots of specifications related to uh, cleaning and conformal coating. And again, these are all available from directly from the IPC website, um, but they do illustrate the process quite nicely. And a recent update of the cleaning guidelines for printed circuit board assemblies uh, was released uh, last year. And this is a particularly authoritative document and very useful as a reference source. Now, if we more talk about coating for a moment, um, there are a number of specifications which are often quoted and many of them you may well be familiar with. Up until recently there was only one book on the subject which was written by James Lacari, uh, Coating Materials for Electronic Applications. And it's quite a thorough book, although a little old by today's standards. A picture book or a visual quality standard uh, is also available if you do a search for the NASA inspection standards. And there's probably about eight or ten pages devoted to conformal coating there, which may again be a useful reference for you. Now more recently, um, this book was introduced in English. Now it has been available for about two years in German and was written by Manfred Super from uh, Werner Peters. It's a very good book and I would certainly recommend it as a good reference source for the complete coating process and of course uh, defects. It does suffer a little bit uh, from the translation into English but the technical content is extremely high. You might be interested that uh, in my IPC book reviews column which appears on the IPC website uh, which actually references this book in the last book review video. Now if we step back for a moment and just briefly talk about uh, cleaning, uh, one of the key things I think that a lot of people don't consider thoroughly is the compatibility of the soils that you're going to remove from a printed circuit board. And it must be compatible with your chosen cleaning product. Now here we have a visual representation of fluid which is being contaminated with flux. And as you can see here, you can see clear material going to rather dark material. But the material has gone into solution. And as the solids content builds up in the cleaning solution, obviously it changes its color. But the important thing is to make sure that whatever process you're using, that the material is truly soluble. In this particular example, you can see that uh, the solids material has separated out to the bottom of the container and this wouldn't generally be considered as fully soluble. So making sure you select a material which is compatible with your cleaning process and obviously your soldering process is fundamental. It's fair to say that a lot of companies have successfully conformally coated without cleaning but again even those companies particularly the automotive industry have been re-looking at cleaning again uh, for certain applications to improve the adhesion and long time reliability of coated products. If you're going to be evaluating a cleaning process to make sure you're removing the flux residues, you might like to consider some of the simple methods that can be conducted. And I'm always very keen on doing simple tests first of all before you do expensive SIR testing and laboratory studies. The key thing is make, looking at the basics first of all. And here we see some paste flux gel uh, which has been taken, it's been weighed out and we've run it through a reflow process. 
So basically, you're then left with all of the non-volatile material, the solids material, uh, within this glass hourglass. You then would might take a quantity of material and then look at its solubility in a cleaning material. Now, in the case on the bottom right, I show a glass slide, uh, which has been through a cleaning process. And you could also use this in a contamination testing system to see how well it represents the contamination level seen by the volume of material you've left on your samples. So it's a practical way of seeing the solubility of the material and also looking at the level of contamination left, if any material has been left on the surface after your cleaning cycle. Another way, simple way, of looking at uh, cleaning and compatibility has been conducted many times in the industry. And this is a, a simple demonstration uh, of some boards um, that the guys at Kaizen were using on the last two practical workshops that I ran, one at Productronica and one at Apex. And basically, they take boards, they solder them, there will inevitably be residues left, but by mechanically removing them after different cleaning process steps, you can assess the level of cleanliness. In their laboratory, what they do is look at the volume of material and put a score on it after the cleaning process. If you use a soldering technique to remove the component, sometimes you displace some of the residue. It's much better to break the component off and you're seeing the total residue left behind. And as you see here, we can see the difference between materials left underneath components after breaking the components in the printed circuit board. Now, this is obviously a destructive technique, but fairly simple as an evaluation technique. Uh, a nicer test, which I've recently been using quite extensively, uh, is a test vehicle that uh, was produced by a company called PBT. And basically, this is a, a glass slide and on it are mounted ceramic components which represent small surface mount components. You can vary the standoff height and you can also vary the size of the component. But this is a standard vehicle. And the idea here is you introduce flux underneath the components that you see here. And then what you can do after different levels of cleaning or different uh, using different uh, cleaning materials, you can assess the cleaning performance underneath the ceramic parts by simply looking through the glass. Very simple. But the other neat thing you can do is if you have automatic optical inspection, AOI, then you can use that for assessing the residues that might be present under the test vehicles and getting a numerical number on its performance. This slide just shows you a close-up of the glass test vehicle at the bottom and then a close-up of the ceramic parts mounted to the glass. And typically when I'm doing cleaning studies, I mount uh, four of these in perhaps the bottom basket if I'm using a dishwasher style cleaning process and perhaps four in the top just to see the performance difference between the front, the back, the top, the middle of your cleaning process. Or alternatively, you could, in a batch process, you could position them in the basket or you could use them for an inline process also. Very simple and it tells you the performance of your process before you go into expensive laboratory studies. No point in doing laboratory studies until you've got confidence that your process is right. It's a waste of money otherwise. Another technique uh, which has been used uh, by a couple of paste manufacturers is to introduce a, a UV trace into the residues. Now what I show you here is a test vehicle that was developed by Indium Corporation. And here you can see the residues under UV or black light uh, fluorescing quite nicely. And a close-up view of the optical image and also the UV image after a unsuccessful cleaning process. The important thing is you have to get your combination of the residues you want to remove and your cleaning process right to get the final results that you feel are appropriate for your company. 
Now another technique which uh, has been gaining favour uh, and particularly in the PCB industry on inner layers of printed circuit boards as we try and overcome problems like CAF within the industry but also on board assemblies that are critical app, go into critical applications and you're going to be conformal coating and this is iron chromatography assessment so it's basically like a CSI type approach you're getting a numerical value for the level of contamination but also being able to illustrate what that particular contamination is from the surface of the printed circuit board and this test is conducted in two ways one you can take a board assembly and put it into a plastic bag with your chosen cleaning solution this is the ionic testing solution not the cleaning solution you would use in a cleaner and then what you're doing is measuring the result that you get it's in a similar technique to the original ionic contamination testing however this is far more detailed now the NPL has conducted testing on iron chromatography and there is some information available from our defect database and we'll talk about that a little later on another technique um, is to localize to do localized testing and here you can see one of my printed circuit boards uh, where we've mounted shields around the components I say we it's the royal we because this was actually done by Doug Pauls for me of Rockwell Collins um, so I must give him credit um, it was probably one of his uh, younger engineers did it actually but uh, I'll give him the credit anyway but what you're looking at is the ability to put in test solution just around the component leave it there for a period of time you can heat the test solution if you wish uh, that uh, improves the solubility of the residues and we actually did this on package on package components um, and then we extracted the required amount of material to allow us to test using iron chromatography so again a more laboratory based technique for measuring contamination left prior to conformal coating I think it's only fair I get the opportunity to plug in my book now um, package on package assembly inspection and quality control it features this test method hence that's why I mention it if you're interested you can download these free of charge as well after the webinar so first of all let's ask the question what process do you use now what I wanted to do as part of this webinar uh, was conduct a short survey and there are three survey questions that we're going to be looking at during our webinar together and the first of them is what process do you use uh, for uh, your assembly and all you need to do is click uh, this one of the points raised here so it's either you're running a no clean process a water wash process a semi aqueous process or a solvent process so if you just like to tick the one which you are currently running within your pro your factory it'll be quite useful when you compare those results uh, with the results of the other three surveys that we'll be conducting during this webinar I'm just going to give you uh, a few more moments if you please just uh, click on the button which represents your process that you're currently running in your factory right now and I'll stop the poll in a couple of moments time okay so I've uh, stopped the poll at that point and I'll be circulating the results of the polls the three polls to you again uh, a little later after the end of this webinar or possibly tomorrow morning now if we sort of move on to quality control checks that we can conduct within a conformal coating process now now we've talked about um, uh, cleaning and monitoring 
a little bit and how you might set up a process or check a process at a very fundamental level. Um, I wanted to also do the same when we talk about conformal coating. Now, again, each of you may be using different processes, dip pros, hand processes. Uh, you might be using a vacuum deposition process for your conformal coating. But what are some of the simple things that you can do? Well, first of all, if you're running a wet process, a spray process, or a dip process, or a manual application, one of the things that you can do, which is fairly simple to do, is measure the wet coating thickness on the surface of your printed circuit board. This gives you a demonstration of the thickness prior to the curing or solvent evaporation of the coating on your printed circuit boards. And you can get, then get a correlation between this thickness and the thickness when the coating has been dried. And recording this information is very useful for statistical process control, but also demonstrating to your customers uh, you have a control process which is running within your factory. Another way of doing that, uh, obviously, is running a test board. Now, I personally think it's important to run a test board in your conformal coating process prior to running your process on real products. Now, it can be a blank board which is of the same design, or it can be a matrix test card. Uh, a Simtech, as one supplier, have matrix test cards that they use to run test runs on and then look at the quality of the application of conformal coating and then monitoring the setup, the temperature, nozzle type speed, all the normal parameters. You then can cure that and save that as a representation to show if you're a subcontractor, your customer, your quality control procedures. Again, very simple, not time consuming, but gives a level more of confidence, particularly on process audits. Now, when we're talking about measuring wet film, um, there's some fairly simple techniques that can be used. Now, on this particular sh slide, I show dry film uh, or uh, cured thickness measurement as well on the top left, but let's concentrate on the other images on top right and on the bottom. And these are very simple gauges which are placed into the surface of the wet deposit to see the thickness which is present on the surface. Now, always remember this is the wet deposit. So if it's a solvent system, as the solvent evaporates, the actual thickness will change, but there will be a correlation between the two. So the individual points on the test gauge, which are often available free, some you might have to buy, uh, will be measured from a set point. As you see here, I'm showing seven thousandths of one inch. And basically what you do is you take your printed circuit board, which has been coated, and you then place your wet gauge onto the surface of the conformal coating and then lift it up and under UV light you'll be able to see the difference between the height of the coating and the height of the test point which is not actually coated or as you can see with the UV not fluorescing on two of the points on the gauge. Now, one of the important things if you're going to use this fairly simple technique is to make sure you actually tell your quality department that there might be some area on the board which uh, perhaps has a small lack of coating or a small indent in the coating because you've done the quality control check. You don't want to be reworking boards unnecessarily because you've done a quality control check on it. Equally, you could do this on a scrap area of the printed circuit board. Again, it's an average number, but again, it's better than doing nothing at all. Another technique uh, for measuring the dry coating can be performed, again, on a test board or a test panel, uh, but it also can be conducted uh, using labels. Some form of label which is placed on the board, which is non-absorbent, which you can coat, dry, and then measure the difference between the label and the coating thickness. 
Now I've been criticized a few times during workshops that this is not very accurate. And I would agree that it's not very accurate. Um, but it's certainly accurate enough when you look at the range of thickness tolerances on most coating processes. So I would suggest that some audit is better than no audit at all. Again, it's something that can be easily implemented in a company for very little cost. If you want to go at a higher cost, you can use a focusing depth microscope and there are also far more expensive pieces of equipment you can buy for measuring thickness. And again, one of the important things I think here with your process is try and measure the thickness in a similar position all of the time. You're probably going to get more repeatability results unless, of course, you change process parameters. But again, experiment, it doesn't take a lot of money and it doesn't take a lot of effort. Now, obviously, you can get uh, digital thickness measurement systems uh, which uh, work with, in different techniques, and these may be more accurate, but again, it's better to do something rather than nothing at all. Now, just as an example, back to my sticky label test, um, here you've got a process panel. You could put uh, small detachable labels on the surface of printed circuit board, and you could put it on the board or on the scrap area. Again, these labels are then removed, and you can compare the thickness of the label as, com as opposed to the thickness of the label with coating on the top. Now, for those people that criticize this technique, I have to ask you, uh, what's the most common technique for measuring parallel coating on a printed circuit board? Now, parallel coating is said to be the Rolls-Royce of coatings, and you can get a very well-defined coating thickness. Well, I guess it is putting sticky labels on boards. You can peel them off, you can see the height. If you're considering using some of the newer techniques for conformal coating, uh, which unfortunately are virtually impossible to measure, and I'm talking about plasma coatings from the two suppliers that offer this, certainly still having a label on the surface will show you whether it's been coated or not. You won't be able to use it as a measuring technique, but by removing the label you can see a difference in the texture of the solder mask. Again, cheap and cheerful, but uh, Anything is better than nothing at all. Now, in terms of uh, inspection and quality control, one of the other things that people, again, sometimes tend to neglect, may I say, is checking temperatures. Now, we check temperatures and profiling of ovens for reflow soldering and wave soldering and selective soldering, so why shouldn't we do it for curing? Now, many of the defects uh, that we see, particularly bubbles, uh, come from trying to speed up the process, cure at too fast a rate, or not actually understanding the temperatures in an inline process. So what I would suggest is that you need to regularly check if you're using UV or IR systems uh, in curing. Again, talk to the material suppliers. They'll give you a lot of recommendations on this. And finally, obviously, the majority of people do use UV light for coating coverage. Now, in your specification with your company or your own department who's doing coating for you, it's important to have three things. First of all, a specification for coating should include where you want coating, where you don't want coating, and also a third thing, which again a lot of people don't actually specify, is where it doesn't matter. So if you have overspray, if you have a small amount of coating contamination, if it doesn't matter in that particular area, there's no point in reworking or rejecting a product for it. Also, it's important, in my opinion, to have a golden board, a board that is a reference. Now, this office obviously uh, exists for other processes within the factory, so just consider something like this for your conformal coating area. Uh, it's also particularly useful when setting up an AOI, Automatic Optical Inspection System. A lot more of the automotive industry are looking for AOI inspection of conformal coating uh, to show coverage 
and of course uh, process defects. So a golden board is a useful technique here. So at this point uh, in uh, the webinar, what I'd like to do is move on to question three. What coating do you currently use? We've talked about the process that goes before coating. So what about the coating process? What material do you currently use on the majority of your printed circuit boards? So you have the choice of epoxy, silicon, paroline, acrylic, or polyamide, poly, polyurethane, my apologies. So if you just like to click on the button and select the coating material you currently use on the majority of your printed circuit boards. And again, I just give uh, a few moments uh, for each of you to uh, select that. So please uh, answer it on the survey, uh, not in the question box. Uh, a couple of people have uh, put uh, their answer in, in the question box. Just tick onto the box on the survey screen you have there and uh, we'll just leave it, give it another uh, few moments before we carry on with the webinar. So just type, just click on the box which represents your answer, the coating process you're currently using on the majority of your products. Okay, so I've stopped uh, the survey. That's the second survey. We'll do one more before we finish the webinar um, this afternoon. So let's start to, to talk about um, coating defects. Now, this is an example of coating bubbles. Now, these are very large bubbles, and I coined the phrase, the term bug eyes. And the reason I did this was uh, if I step back when I produced my first training CD on conformal coating, uh, a lot of people talk about fish eyes as a defect, but nobody could ever tell me what a fish eye really was. And this was also true of many of the companies that uh, offer coating systems. But it's been a term which has been in the industry for many years. So I coined another term, bug eyes, where you've got <laughs> much larger uh, voids in the coating. Now, these are caused by fast curing, not allowing the solvent to evaporate from the surface of the coating, but also where there is a lot of air trapped, particularly under large components. So you can get this happening where you're not allowing those three things to occur. Again, this would be outside of the normal recommendation of the coating supplier. So this is quite uncommon, but again, it is seen. So you might not like the term bug eyes, but you know, that's the term that uh, I felt was most appropriate for this type of defect. Now, minor de-wetting or bubbles. Now, it's difficult to actually quantify um, this because the majority of people don't want to measure things, and I fully understand that. In fact, you know, IPC tries to avoid measuring things. We talk about percentages of pad and percentages of solder joint on a pad, but uh, it's quite difficult to actually say that a bubble of ten thousandths of an inch or ten microns is okay and one that's bigger is not. Um, I think the critical thing with bubbles and minor de-wetting, which can happen at the surface uh, when you're coating, um, you should look at where it's actually on the surface. So something like this where we've got minor de-wetting or we've got bubbles on the surface of packages or on the surface of a substrate where there is no electrical uh, con uh, contacts and the bubbles or voids are not between those contacts, it really uh, is not something that should be reworked or rejected. And in a lot of companies, this is the case, although that does go against some of the specifications which exist within the industry. Now, I thought it was useful uh, to show an example, a video clip, um, of bubbles in coatings and, and show you what happens or can happen uh, when the bubble breaks. Now, we've got uh, a few bubbles that you'll see. 
you'll see it break, but also what you're now seeing is de-wetting take place. And hopefully uh, you can see this uh, fairly easily on your screen and you're seeing like a dark area. So if that had cured and the bubble was still present, it's a bubble. Obviously the bubble has broken, the solvent has escaped or the air has escaped, but so voids and bubbles can be uh, caused by local de-wetting on the surface which then results uh, in what looks like a bubble. So this is just a nice video clip which illustrates that type of phenomena. So if we just go back to bubbles for a moment, I think that uh, if you've got bubbles, voids on the surface of components, um, as I show on one of the images on the screen here, this is atrocious, this is very, very bad, but it's never going to have any effect whatsoever on the reliability of that product. But if you then put the bubbles uh, and have them between active terminations, then perhaps that's a much more serious situation because you are actually reducing the insulation gap uh, between those terminations because no insulation exists. So you may well find that some specifications from some suppliers will actually say there shouldn't be any bubbles between terminations of, let's say, less than uh, uh, 25 thousandths of an inch or 20 thousandths of an inch or whatever. Or they might say that if there is a bubble, provided that the minimum coating insulation is still X, then that may be acceptable. Again, that's something that uh, needs to possibly be proved, but uh, that was, that's something that a lot, a lot of specifications do include. And on the third example, I thought it was worth showing you here, you've obviously got bubbles associated with through hole, and in this particular case, you can see the bubbles are between those two terminations. So you've actually got like a tent growing between two terminations. So in terms of protection, if there is something ionic, corrosive, below the coating between those two terminations, your coating is not going to stop a reaction taking place because moisture will permeate through and can be present and then react with what is underneath the coating. So again, where the bubbles are will have an impact on what you'll get when you do testing or reliability studies. Now, this uh, next video, again, I thought it was uh, useful to show, and it's something that I created um, a couple of months back, probably about six months back, and I think it emphasized again that um, yes, you can have bubbles in coating, but the key thing is have you changed your process? Have you actually speeded up your process? Have you increased the thickness of the coating on your boards prior to the bubbles appearing? Or is it a case that somebody's tried to speed up the process, they change the solids content within the material, which again would impact the solvent coming out from the coating, or if you're trying to cure the coating, are you forced curing it, and again, you're literally baking or curing uh, those bubbles into that surface. So again, you've got to really think hard and look very closely at the process. And I don't know about you as an engineer, I never tend to believe anybody. If somebody says they've never changed the process, I tend not to believe them, and that's no disrespect to my fellow engineers. I just like to go and see for myself. So always ask the questions, go down there on the shop floor and see what's actually going on, and do some experiments as well to understand the process. Now there are basically two forms of electro uh, corrosion, electrochemical reaction. Um, Dendrites is probably the most commonly uh, discussed or, or, or common defect that most people talk about. And that's illustrated on uh, one of our MPL slides uh, with a photograph showing dendrite shorts between two conductors at the bottom of this slide. Um, a nice fern-like deposit between uh, 
the anode and the cathode, or the minus and the plus. And to the side of it is something which uh, has gained more importance, well I suppose not importance, that's probably wrong, it's probably sort of gained more attention over the last few years, and this is CAF. And CAF is a low resistance path, which a chemical low resistance path, which forms between individual strands of glass within the printed circuit board substrate. And if that corresponds between two closely spaced plated through holes or via holes on a printed circuit board, it can lead to failure of a product. And uh, this has been much discussed. There is test methods within the IPC and IPC standards. And there's been a lot of research work and still some going on with a big project with the National Physics Laboratory. Now these photographs just show verification of CAF um, and it's just taken from one of our presentations. And you can actually see in the color photograph on the top left uh, where we've got a line through the resin and glass bundles in a printed circuit board between those two surfaces. And the other examples are measurement of what the actual material is. Now, a lot of companies have seen the separation of the epoxy from the glass strands within the bulk of the printed circuit board. So if this does occur, possibly because uh, some of the resin systems are harder, or possibly the higher temperature has uh, created micro delamination between these surfaces, or perhaps the material which is coating the glass, so between the glass and the epoxy, uh, doesn't allow a bond to take place, then you can get this chemical reaction which takes place, which is referred to as CAF. Now if we just uh, step back to standard copper dendrites. Now I thought it was useful to show this because these are dendrites forming within an encapsulation material. So you've got three examples here. Um, the first experiment I did was the one in the middle. And what I did is took a sample of a product which had failed and I mechanically ground, just like you would do a microsection, ground up through the board, not down through the board, but actually through the board to the back of the pads. And what you're seeing here is the copper pads and then the green area is the solder resist and the fern light deposit is the dendrites which are forming. So that was a, a very cheap method of evaluating this problem for a customer. But I thought I'd go one stage further and use two other techniques to illustrate the same fault. And the reasoning behind that is that if you have this type of uh, uh, a small failure, uh, uh, an intermittent failure, then you can use x-ray to find it. And on the left hand side is the x-ray version of the image uh, within the center. And again, you can still pick that out. I actually um, did some failure analysis literally a couple of weeks ago uh, where we were looking at uh, metal backed boards, so metal boards, um, and we got uh, failures and it was to do with dendrites. And again, just with x-ray, no mechanical testing, I was able to show the dendrite formation. And on the right-hand side of this image, it's a lovely image uh, that uh, Dave Bernard, a good friend of mine, produced uh, with me. And again, you can see the pseudo 3D or the CT version of the same failure. So again, don't just um, uh, use the traditional tests. Use some of the other test methods that you've got. It might be very useful. For those of you, and I, I think that you know the majority of the industry has seen dendrites forming, but I guess uh, no presentation is uh, complete without a dendrite formation. And this video clip um, is, I made this when I was about 22 years old. Uh, I only had a black and white camera in those days. There are better ones in the industry, um, but I just like to stick with the ones I produce myself. And you're looking at uh, copper dendrites forming between uh, a track, two tracks on a printed circuit board in the presence of moisture uh, with a 5 volt supply um, and the track to track separation is 10 thousandths of one inch or 
uh, US 10 mils. Just a nice example of that formation taking place. Now a lot of people talk about conformal coating and also for cleaning and we step back for cleaning to a moment. Um, if you are going to clean, I've already said that the important thing is making sure the material that you want to remove from a printed circuit board is soluble. Now here we've got a, a good example where we've got the bottom of two QFNs which have been broken from the surface of the board, they're my packages after a cleaning study that I was doing um, and I've broken them from the surface. Now you can see on the left hand side perfectly clean. On the right hand side we have residues left and these are non-soluble residues in that the cleaning process was not able to dissolve the material and mechanically remove it. Cleaning works in two ways. One, the material is soluble and then you're using mechanics to aid the cleaning process or to remove uh, the rinse solution uh, from the board, air, heat, etc. But if you don't dissolve the residues, you trap them there and potentially then you might still have a cleaning or contamination issue. So again, look at the basics before you actually look at the chemistry. Again, I think that most of you will be familiar with traditional contamination testing and I just illustrate this with one slide. Again, um, in the UK industry we always used to use a 50-50 test solution um, purely because the Ministry of Defence uh, specified that in the US it tends to be 75-25, 75% ice isopropyl alcohol, 25% water and there are three or four machines available in the industry uh, to conduct this testing. SIR on the other hand, again expensive technique but this is really the test technique uh, to use when you've qualified the basics of your process and then you're needing to qualify the process perhaps for a customer or a new product. But please don't use this technique unless you have confidence your process is running correctly. Otherwise it's expensive and you have to start again. Get the basics right before you move on. Of course the process can also be used for contamination, conformal coating materials and evaluation of the total process uh, which is what is highlighted in the IPC standards, the method of qualifying the whole process, not an individual material or an individual process step. And just uh, some, some results uh, from uh, studies conducted on boards around connectors, QFPs and different devices. And you can see here that uh, the failure uh, on the QFP was noted by quite a significant change uh, in the resistance and highlighted with the uh, corrosion growth uh, on the photograph at the bottom of the screen as you see here. Now corrosion can occur uh, not only on the board, on the top surface, underneath coatings, underneath encapsulants, but this is just a nice example of a material manufacturer actually using um, uh, the test, so creating dendrites to qualify rework and fluxes. So uh, a particular manufacturer used this uh, to see whether one fluxing material after a soldering operation and a rework operation, whether one performed better than the other. And these stills are taken from a video of uh, his experiments. And what you actually sh could see is copper dendrites, but these ones would be silver dendrites uh, from the surface of these chip terminations. Now one of the other things when you're preparing your printed circuit board for conformal coating, you know, we clean. Um, and if you've finished all of your soldering operations, then, you know, that, that's fine. But uh, if you're cleaning midway through your assembly process, as some companies want to do, or you clean uh, side one and then move on, or perhaps you clean because you're unhappy with the cleanliness of the printed circuit board because you've had a wash off in uh, the printing process. Just bear in mind that the surface finish can be affected by cleaning processes. 
So when you're evaluating hand wipes, hand cleaning or mask cleaning, make sure they're not going to affect the wettability or solderability of your surface finish. The sample in the center image and the samples on the right hand side were both examples of cleaning which affected the wettability and solderability and actually created wicking solder defects. So it's not really a board finish problem, it was the process which caused this particular problem. Now white residues uh, are well known in the industry for materials on a printed circuit board which are non-soluble. Um, but I thought it was worth uh, showing this and I have illustrated this on a few occasions before. This is a BGA and you're seeing a beautiful white ring uh, like a, a, a polo mint or a, 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 a white ring, that's the best description probably, around the BGA joints. And what has happened here is this board is a no clean uh, process, but it's actually been through a contamination testing. It's good practice that if you are going to test the board uh, as part of your quality control process within your facility, to actually indicate that board's been through a different process. It might seem like a trivial thing to do, but I've seen this on a few occasions where people have questioned about the pro whether it's a problem or not, and it's simply that that board has, with the flux residues which perhaps were no clean, have gone into a cleaning process effectively, which is what ionic testing is doing. It's dissolving the residues to give you a number of the cleanliness level, and they weren't soluble. So this board probably would have given you a perfectly good clean result, although it wasn't because it hadn't dissolved the material. Again, something different. So at that point in the proceedings, what I'd like to do is uh, run the third survey. Now the final survey uh, is what is your most common coating problem? So what is your most common coating problem? So obviously I've had to select some and I, I apologize if your coating problem isn't in the list, but I've picked what I think is the most common. So if you just like to click one of the examples here that you would say is the most common problem you come up against. So I'll just give you a, a few moments for all of you to select one of the defects. And I said I apologize. Obviously in the Q&A session, uh, you can always uh, highlight uh, any other common problems you have. But uh, let's just pick up on these as common problems and see which one actually comes out as the most common within the industry within the number of people that are logged on to this webinar this afternoon. So we're up to 70%, so there's uh, another 25% uh, 20, of people still to vote, so I'll give you a few more moments. The nice thing about running surveys uh, is it allows me to have a quick mouthful of coffee while I'm presenting, while you, while you guys are working. I use the term guys, so I apologize if there's any ladies uh, uh, present, but guys is a general term. Okay, so that's pretty much 100%. Uh, uh, so I'm going to close, uh, close the survey at that point, and we'll continue with the presentation. So a reminder, I'll uh, make the survey results because it's, it's kind of useful, kind of interesting just to see that uh, out of the hundreds of people that uh, are attending this particular event, at least you get a feel for what people have said. Okay, PCB surface corrosion, but this is corrosion underneath conformal coating. Now, you can get traditional corrosion growth like dendrites very, very easily. You can get verdigris uh, on copper finishes. Um, but you can also get uh, sulfur corrosion type defects. Um, if you've got a product uh, in or positioned uh, or located in a sulfur rich environment, even if it's got a conformal coating, you can still get corrosion. And probably the most common examples of that is boards that uh, have exposed copper and another metal uh, which uh, 
will corrode and react. So although conformal coating will protect those surfaces to some degree, again they're still exposed. So corrosion can penetrate or the gaseous material can penetrate to some degree. So this is an example, the photograph is an example of one of one example of sulfur corrosion where um, the product was in uh, a studio environment and corrosion allowed an open circuit to occur between the pad and some of the tracking. Uh, we could all argue perhaps the coating thickness wasn't thick enough, but just to make the point that uh, when you're looking at coatings and when you're working with a supplier or working with a customer, you've got to determine what sort of environment your product's going to go into and get a recommendation on what sort of thickness that might be appropriate for those particular applications. Now contamination, and there's been a lot of examples of contamination um, that I've seen recently. Now there's the obvious contamination and then there's a subtle contamination. As more and more products are coated and it becomes more and more uh, prevalent to coat connectors, um, we've got to think about wicking where the material can wick through the body of the connector along the contacts. And in this particular case, we've used UV light uh, to show up some of the coating on the gold contacts. Now, we could all argue that on the first insertion and withdrawal, the first mating of the connector, that the coating would be removed and there would be no problem. Um, but again, I don't think that's something you would probably wish to try and argue with a customer, whether that be the case or not. But the important thing is to be able to inspect and check. Now, even with a spray system or a jetting system for conformal coating, some of the best in the marketplace, wicking can still occur. And wicking is where the material is drawn through the body and then ends up on the active part of the pins. Now, gelling materials are available from the different coating material manufacturers. So you can actually put a gel coat on, which is basically a high solids or 100% uh, solid coating material prior to coating with a traditional conformal coating material. So you're basically using a mask uh, to protect from capillary action. You can also investigate uh, changing the formulation of your coating material or increasing the solids content uh, perhaps to decrease uh, the capillary action that might take place. But that's an experimentation thing you need to con conduct with your supplier. Now, poor coating adhesion is something that uh, we have suffered from, and we pretty much all know that when we're talking about plastic components, um, they have release compounds on which potentially uh, can allow conformal coating to separate. But I thought this was kind of neat. Uh, here you can see, obviously, the conformal coating separating from a component, but you can actually see the marking in the conformal coating of the component. So I wonder if this is a, a brand new technique for identifying counterfeit components. I don't know. Uh, just interesting, and it's, it's, uh, I've only seen this uh, two or three times uh, in my career. Um, but again, it depends on the method of applying the marking to the surface of the plastic. Um, also, even with uh, mechanical abrasion techniques and laser, the coating can go into the surface, the subsurface if you like, and then when it's removed, it would still give an indication of the number. But uh, again, something slightly different. Now, contamination on the printed circuit board obviously is important, um, and it may or may not affect the functionality. But uh, a little bit of a trivial defect, but um, it's important if you are going to do rework and repair and reapply coatings to printed circuit boards. If you are going to use a manual technique, uh, like brushing, as shown here, it's important to spend a little bit of money on decent brushes. Uh, you can clearly see that no effort, no money has been uh, <laughs> wasted here on the brushes used to manually coat the printed circuit board. And I have to say, when I was a young engineer back in when I was 20, 22, my very first job as a quality control engineer was to write a specification which said how many brush hairs could be left on the surface of the board uh, with, without the necessity for rework. 
very well young engineers always get bad jobs but clearly that was one for me but in those days our company had two processes one was Paraline the Rolls-Royce and the second one was brush coating so again be sensible about setting criteria but try and eliminate the possibility of the problem occurring by using the right tools for the job this is just a, another example of component obviously coating lifting from the surface of parts um, and we were able to take these printed circuit boards this is actually a QFN package quad flat no lead package or a, a bottom termination part as IPC choose to call them um, and you can see the coating has separated and when we were examining the parts if we did do a cleaning operation uh, just a semi aqueous cleaning operation um, the adhesion was improved significantly so on that occasion we were able to demonstrate that the, the parts could be cleaned and overcome the adhesion problem that's not always the case now this is a uh, coating de-wetting um, and I illustrated this somewhat uh, uh, simply with the video clip earlier so you can have a perfect coating but you get this sort of de-wetting takes place now any contamination which might be present uh, from the surface of the printed circuit board when and after you've gone through the assembly process but remember we're adding material to a board and particularly with a no clean process you really haven't necessarily uh, known where that contamination may be coming from it may be fumes that are recondensing on the surface of a printed circuit board from reflow operation it can be spitting from uh, the wave process or fluxing process but equally we can get contamination from PCB fabrication the final cleaning stage of a board prior to shipping to you the customer uh, should remove any form of soils from the board but again when you visit PCB manufacturers there are occasions when the cleaning process is not very effective so again it's one of those auditing process you should look at so that's the final cleaning step uh, prior to shipment this is when the boards have been separated out and they've been through their inspection their electrical test etc the final cleaning step before wrapping and packing and shipping now again it's a a test which uh, a lot of companies don't do and one of the other things that quite often companies don't do is specify the type of solder resist or solder mask um, often you may have seen with formal coating suppliers they request or suggest that you use a, a coating with a surface a certain surface tension or a dime pen measurement qualified number um, and what I'm showing you here is just uh, me testing resists with dime pens and I'm not a great lover of this test but it does work to a degree and it shows up the surface tension of the material so if you buy printed circuit boards it is good practice perhaps not to specify a dime number but it's certainly very good practice to specify the coating that you're getting from your supplier too few companies specify this and not just to do with coating it's to do with the whole manufacturing process and I believe that you should know what the coating is a lot of people say well it's green and it meets IPC 840 that's great but you need to go that stage further and understand what material is being used on your board because how can you then go to another supplier who's offering cheaper boards if you don't know what you've got to start off with if that's working perfectly that's great but what about your next supplier at least if you know they're both using uh, a Lee Rennell product a Coates product at least you know at least it's the same now this is a very very old test um, I'm an old engineer and this is something called the water break test and this is a test that can be applied very very simply for you to use to assess products I just thought it was useful to uh, to show you this um, I was working in a factory in Spain and I got some boards um, and did this test in a PCB fabrication factory and the gentleman I was working for said he hadn't seen this test used for the last 30 years well fine I apologize but 
it's tricks of the trade. If something works for you, then use it, particularly if you haven't got a laboratory. So what, we, what are we doing? We've basically got bits of copper. They've been chemically cleaned. So what should happen when you apply water to the surface, um, the water should be retained. It shouldn't de-wet, as you show in the video. So it should be a perfect surface coating of water. So if you put this through a process where contamination could affect coating adhesion or, or, or any sort of uh, material on that surface, then again you can see that one thing has had an effect. If you look at the sec first example, uh, what I've done here is I've applied different types of masking tape to the surface of this panel. I've then put it through a heating process or a process that I'm going to um, uh, subject the boards to and then I've removed the coating and you can see the degree of residues. If you take, let's say, a paper masking tape and polyamide tape, Kapton tape, and at evaluate the amount of residues left behind, you'll see a marked difference with different materials. So if you're trying to use a material which leaves minimum residues or no residues at all, this is a very simple, very cheap test as a comparative technique. I can see everybody rushing out and buying lots of bits of copper. But remember, if you're a PCB user, um, your PCB manufacturer has stacks of this uh, and I'm sure he'd be more than happy to give you some uh, samples to play with. Now if you're doing rework and repair, which unfortunately uh, does occur uh, on your conformal coating materials, there are different techniques. And all the different rework techniques are defined in the IPC rework standards. And it says how to do it, what to do it, when to do it, and what you should expect to see. Uh, I have to say, Personally, there is only one rework technique that I would ever really use in a manufacturing environment which is compatible with pretty much every coating. It costs a little bit more money, but you know that's the, that's the direction I would take. Um, what I'm showing you here is just a, a couple of examples of uh, problems about uh, removing coating. Now, you can use heated tools, and that's what we've done on the first example. And you can see this uh, paralene coating, which is about uh, 20 microns uh, thick. So when we've soldered through or heated through to remove the component, the component comes off beautifully. But you're left with a lot of residues you've got to clean up afterwards. Um, so still you've got to go back and mechanically remove that material. Uh, on the right-hand side, we can see charring, possibly of the flux still left on the printed circuit board underneath the coating or the coating. So Again, using heating techniques, uh, soldering techniques through coatings um, can leave just as much damage that you've got to then redress afterwards. So again, look at the different uh, removal techniques from your different suppliers and see which you feel is the most effective. I must say, as I said earlier, I'm a 100% fan of abrasive removal. Um, and I would not contend with uh, using chemicals in manufacture or burning through coatings uh, personally. Now, selective coating. Now, a lot of companies don't have a spray system, don't have a dip system. They have simple manual application, and that will work perfectly well for certain applications. And I wanted to show you side-by-side -side comparison. And here you've got on the right-hand side one area on a board that for electrical reasons. I'm a mechanical engineer, so I don't understand those things. But had the part had to be coated, the board surface area had to be coated in this one area. Um, and they've achieved 100% coverage. It's beautiful. You can see there's a depth of thickness to the coating. But you can see that it's pretty messy in its application under UV light. But again, if that's what you want and that's what you have to do on your product, please just define that uh, to your subcontractor and make sure your quality department understand that. Because in this particular example, um, people were asked to rework this because people thought it was messy. Yes, it is. But did it fulfill the requirements of the process? Yes, it did. So again, 
quality standards sometimes generate more rework than is actually necessary. Personal opinion coming from a quality background on my previous careers. Now satisfactory coating, now this is just an example of a PLCC uh, which obviously has corner areas which the coating is not visible on. Now this is under UV light and so is this acceptable or not? Well I would say that provided the coating is present around the active termination areas, the solder joint areas, between the termination areas on the PCB, absolutely. Uh, if there is a, a loss on the plastic surface, as long as there isn't really any evidence of the coating coming off, it's just literally a difference in thickness shown up by the UV light, I would say this is perfectly satisfactory, as I've said in this example. So I think that um, one of the key things to do if you need to enhance the quality standards within your own company, um, you need to take lots of photographs yourself and then build up your own reference standard, not going against uh, the excellent uh, standards within IPC, but augmenting them, improving them, making them more relative to your own manufacturing process and also your own company. Dendrite formation, just another example of dendrite formation between two terminations and we've already mentioned that um, this is a result of moisture, an applied voltage and some form of ionizable material. The closer the gap, the more likely this is to occur, the further the gap apart, the less likely this is to occur, the more moisture which is present or water droplets that are present, again, it's more likely to occur. So you've got to think about how something occurs. So even with a no clean process, you can get corrosion growth in a very adverse environment. Another example of surface contamination, and these are not bubbles, this is what looks more like, more like uh, some form of surface contamination which has prevented adhesion, again on the mask. So sometimes it's difficult to actually 100% define what the root cause of the, material, of the problem is, but you just got to step back and go through and step through the process and see what's at the and also see whether adhesion of the mask to the surface are actually affected in reality. Now capillary action is something that we've seen a lot of recently and possibly where the solids content of the conformal coating has decreased. But this is an example of capillary or wicking uh, where the material that's been applied to the printed circuit board has wicked underneath the component. It's more common on QFPs, QFNs, uh, small packages uh, where you've got tight lead spacing and of course it will reduce the thickness of the coating in sensitive areas. So you've got to look at what you can do to eliminate this problem or certainly improve it and possibly on some occasions this may mean a two application step process which is not desirable because of the time and cost involved. Another example of uh, corrosion and dendrite formation, in this particular case up and to and inside the connector. And what has happened here is that during selective soldering or wave soldering there's been excessive flux has been applied, that's the first thing, but possibly the preheat to the printed circuit board during the soldering operation was not appropriate. However, as it's up inside the connector, it's probably due to the first example, you've got too much material left which hasn't been exposed to preheat and hence deactivation of the flux. So again look at the volume of material present on this particular example. Now incomplete coverage again is a process issue in my opinion and here you see um, coating which is fairly good uh, on uh, one of the resistors, not so good on the second and I think this is just literally uh, a process issue, a programming issue, and you need to go back and look at the machine which has created uh, this particular example. Now unmasking or unsatisfactory masking, now it's nice if you are using masking to actually have a masking material that fluoresces and these are some paper dots that do fluoresce under UV light and they're quite visible. But as you can see we're doing a, a range of boards in one manual spraying operation but there clearly is 
some areas which haven't been masked. And I just thought I'd point them out here uh, with the yellow arrow. So again, sometimes the masking can actually aid your inspection. A lot of people want to try and avoid masking, as I would do, but if you are going to use it, use it appropriately as a technique to assist your manufacturing process. Okay, so I've tried to cover lots of different cleaning, contamination, testing, coating uh, defects in this webinar. And I just wanted to mention, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the National Physics Laboratory has been running the defect database uh, for three years now. And this is something with the URL at the bottom of this page you can access at any time, day or night, 24-7. You can look at defects, you can blow them up full screen and print them out for reference and for training within your own company, all free of charge. But you can also do a search, and this is the search screen, which allows you to specify your process, your alloy, your defect type, your product volume. Or you can do a random search, again, by typing, typing something into the free search box. Now, that resource also gives you access to nearly all of the MPL reports. In that, the National Physics Laboratory has been running tests and evaluations and projects on electrical interconnection for many, many years. So I've listed a few here which relate to uh, tin whiskers, conformal coating, co corrosion, etc. But there's over 150 documents you can download. So this is just a, a few that I've listed on this particular page, but all of those are available uh, by going to the defect database and you can download those or do a search for uh, projects that you might be interested. We're just running uh, two projects at the moment, uh, another one on CAF, uh, which I'm not sure when that will be in the public domain, and uh, we're also running on high temperature uh, soldering and high temperature interconnection, which hopefully will be in the public domain very, very shortly. So check out the defect database. Finally, here is the listing that I promised right at the very start of this webinar of all of the specifications, IPC standards, uh, that I'm aware of, and I apologize if I've missed any, that relate to cleaning, contamination testing, and obviously coating. And also, I've listed, again, reports that uh, are represented in the previous slide, and all the books that I'm aware of relating to conformal coating uh, and cleaning. So again, there's a reference source for you. Um, and this is the same reference source that I've uh, used on the IPC book review list, the video that I do occasionally. Uh, and back to uh, where we started. And a reminder, these are the seminars that we're running at the MPL Smart Group Cleaning and Contamination Testing Center uh, at the NEC Birmingham on the 8th to the 10th of April. If you want to come along, it's free. You can attend the seminars, have a play with the conformal coating processes that we're running. Just uh, follow the URL. So, we're now to question time. Um, now, what I would like to do is pick up on some of the questions that have already been asked, and there have been a few which have already come in. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question on any of the topics um, that I have uh, talked about or alluded to or suggested cause and cures for, um, then all you need to do is type them directly into the control panel. And uh, I'll do five or six questions. Um, and if there are too many, then uh, again, you can always visit the, uh, the feature area and we'll be happy to deal with those uh, with you on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, first question, how do you check the thickness of coating on component leads? Again, a very good question, and something that my sticky label test would not uh, allow you to do. So all I can say is if you need to qualify a product or a process and you're going to want to measure coating on leads, lead frames, etc., uh, microsectioning is probably the reference test method to use. Um, the important thing is when you're doing microsection of a sample um, that you make sure the epoxy will adhere to the coating. And you've got to be very careful 
because if it doesn't or if the coating is soft then during the microsection preparation you'll remove the coating from the surface you're trying to measure so it might be quite difficult um, so that's probably the most common technique that is used um, so just a, a, a couple of people that when we were doing the survey uh, <laughs> A couple of people said, uh, you know, they, they use acrylic, uh, um, and um, uh, Giles was saying that uh, his most common problem is overspray, uh, and uh, also we'd like a cup of coffee too. Uh, that's Vincent. Well, thank you very much. Um, but I'm doing all the talking, so I think I deserve it. Um, okay, the, the uh, fluoropolymer. Fluoropolymer coatings, um, what is the real value versus traditional conformal coatings? Um, these materials basically stop moisture uh, forming on a surface and it allows the material to ball up. So it's, it's not allowing the water droplets or water to stay in one place. So if you've got a product that's stay, uh, set, set uh, horizontally, moisture could still form on a surface as balls or droplets, but if the product is angled, as a product might be in a, a, a high reliability application, um, then the material is just going to run off. The material is changing the surface tension of the surface and also changing the surface tension of um, uh, the board and components. So, you know, that's where the value is. You have to decide whether that's appropriate or useful to you. Next question, um, what is the benefit of using uh, preheaters in conformal coating machines? Uh, conformal coat, well, coating or potting systems sometimes uh, have used uh, preheat uh, to allow material to capillary underneath parts, but it's kind of a tricky process to actually run because you must make sure you're not curing the material as part of the process because obviously any defects like bubbles or gassing uh, would be held in place. Uh, part of the reason that uh, a lot of materials require a hold time prior to curing is to allow any trappage to escape prior to curing. Uh, if you're talking about um, UV cure materials or epoxy materials, then that might be slightly different. But the key thing is you must follow the manufacturer's recommendations on profiling and heating. Okay, uh, John asked the question, uh, what is the Rolls-Royce coating? Uh, paraline. Um, paraline is a gaseous process. Uh, when applied, a printed circuit board is added to a chamber. The material itself uh, forms a coating which is a defined thickness based on the process parameters. So if, you've, if you want somewhere between 10 to 15 microns, that's what you will get. But that will be everywhere. The problem about paraline is masking. Masking has to be 100% because being a gaseous environment that you're introducing the board into, if the areas you don't want coating uh, to be applied are not sealed, you will get that coating. Okay, uh, question on rework of uh, paraline coatings. Uh, you'll find that um, uh, most coating manufacturers, I mean, an example like uh, uh, Humacil as an example, uh, will provide or suggest materials for coating. So you're using a different coating material. You're not going to go back and use the paraline coating process to rework boards that have actually had the coating removed. I mean, if you were removing substantial amounts of the material from the surface, possibly, uh, but I think that would be unlikely. You'll be using another material. Okay, Graham's asking, uh, what is your understanding of the industry test requirements for coating adhesion to solder mask? Well, the traditional test methods uh, are adhesion testing using tape 
and scoring the surface of the coating on the solder mask in question. Um, the same technique is also used for solder masks. Every time I use this technique, I get more and more disillusioned by it, but it is the technique which is in all the standards. I, um, NPL, the National Physics Laboratory, have done a lot of work on coating adhesion uh, testing. There is a technical paper there which was presented at IPC Apex, and there's also a technical report that's available from the NPL website on work we've done. That test method and methodology has been passed to IPC, which may be considered uh, or included in documents in the future. So I would check that out. Okay, uh, how can you overcoat a soft coating with a hard coating for microsectioning? No, that's, uh, that's a question from Doug. Um, absolutely, uh, I think I did allude to that. Uh, that's the problem of microsectioning. The only the only thing I would say is that um, if you do it really really slowly, um, you can still measure between the surface of the leg and the epoxy which is left behind. So you may have a gap there, but that's still giving you fairly good confidence that um, the material is giving you a reference mark, even though you can't actually measure the actual material still embedded in the microsection. But you know it is a common problem which I mentioned. Okay, just, just take uh, just a couple of more questions as we're running out of time. Any peelable masking materials available for connect... Oh, yes. Um, the material um, for sealing connectors uh, is available from some of the coating material suppliers. Now, I don't want to be commercial, but I, I certainly know that Humaseal does offer two of their products as 100% solids material, uh, which can be applied prior to using the conventional coating materials. I feel sure that uh, all of the other materials uh, offer that type, but remember that some materials, because of the higher solids content, won't capillary to the same degree. So you need to look at the different materials and how much they actually capillary. Okay, it's pretty much come to um, the end of uh, our webinar. And what I would like to do is thank you for all your questions. Sorry if we haven't had time to uh, pick up on all the questions. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, MPL and Smart Group for inviting me to do this presentation. And if you are able to, if you're in uh, UK or Europe and you're able to uh, come to the MPL Smart Group Conformal Coating and Cleaning Experience uh, at the NEC in Birmingham uh, in a few weeks' time, we'd love to see you and look forward to, to you attending the workshops. So on behalf of Smart Group, the National Physics Laboratory, myself, Bob Willis, I'd like to thank you for attending and also wish you a very good afternoon or morning for those of you in the US. Thank you very much once again.